I tried very hard in this book to sum up many years of research and writing and talking with groups like this one and being asked questions and uh, trying to, to answer them and trying to make sense of the world as it is. And the financial crisis was the crowning blow. So I thought now I really have to sit down and show how all of these things converge. And they do converge. The financial crisis is a long chapter. I'm not going to tell you the content because we'd be here all night. But believe me, it was manufactured. Lots of people said, why did nobody saw this coming? What do you mean nobody saw it coming? At TNI, we saw it coming. At Attac, which is my organization in France, we saw it coming. Uh, it's only the people who were responsible who pretend, or maybe they didn't see it coming, but they, they did everything possible to make it happen. They deregulated, they privatized, they made the banks too big to fail, they got rid of all of the, strict, the strictures on banking. So that was one thing, and it has caused enormous misery. You know that even this year there have already been a million evictions, f further evictions of poor people from their homes who could not keep up with their mortgage payments. The subprime mortgage crisis is not over in the United States, and the ripple effects of, of that crisis caused by a very tiny minority uh, have continued to uh, flow through the world, and now they have migrated to Europe where the sovereign debt crisis is simply another impact of the financial crisis. Uh, I was too late to write about that except the beginnings of the, the, the Greek uh, crisis, but it is because the governments uh, were bailing out the banks that that, that caused largely the, the sovereign debt crisis. I won't go into detail there either. But that's the <coughs> big crisis that, that set this whole thing going. Crisis is the wrong word. I use it, but a crisis literally is a decision point. In Greek, it is the point where if you are in, a, in an illness, you either go, go towards recovery or, or you die. Uh, and a crisis does not last for four years the way this one has done. So th that's the wrong word, but we all use it. You can't get rid of it. But we're in a permanent kind of, of um, situation which is caused by 30 years of neoliberalism and which has been intentional, but for those who caused it, has been an incredible enrichment. And that comes to the second chapter, which is the crisis of poverty and inequality. Uh, inequalities have grown all over. Just one example, in the United States, the top 1% used to take 8% of all of the national revenues. This, has, this was already quite a large fraction, but now it's three times that. And this is the same thing in almost all countries. The, the, the differences have between the rich and the poor have grown much greater, the rich have grown much richer. I describe the World Wealth Report of Merrill Lynch, which will give you an idea of what has happened. It's not just the 1% and the 99%, it's the 0, 0,1%. It's 1% of, uh, of, uh, of 1%. And then if you go up to the Forbes list, it's 1% of 1% of 1%. And then we're at the top of Mount Everest, uh, where the people who really count in the world uh, can be found, you know, way up there. But the crisis of inequality has had knock-on effects uh, as well. But it is strictly linked to the, to the financial crisis. The third chapter concerns the crises of the, what I call the most basic basics, which are food and water, what no one can live without. Uh, access to the sources of life are becoming more and more difficult. Uh, for more and more people in the world. The financial crisis also contributed to the enormous increase in food prices in 2007, 2008. Um, and that put another 100 million people into the ranks of the chronically hungry. Uh, and it was very much linked to speculation on food. Uh, there were, on those food markets the, for wheat, rice, soya, corn, in the period of 2005-2006, there were $13 billion riding on those markets. Two years later, 
20 times that, $260 billion, which did not have anything to do with actually buying a wheat contract, buying a, 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 a delivery of wheat or of rice or of soya or of corn, but simply speculating on what the price was going to be. And that drove prices up. One day in March of 2008, the price of wheat went up by, th by 21, what it was, no, 31 percent. This is not farmers and cookie manufacturers uh, deciding what the price is going to be that day. This is speculators finding a new terrain and the fact that that will kill or maim people several thousand kilometers away makes absolutely no difference. <coughs> and finally, among the crises, the ecological crisis, which we have been intensely discussing for two days at TNI and which is, I mean, I consider myself perhaps reasonably well informed. Well, let me tell you, friends, it's worse than I thought. But there are also some very hopeful stories. There are also people who are already organizing and we hope to be among them and we hope to bring in a new book coming out with TNI uh, soon, we're not quite sure when, but no later than June, and possibly on the net, and we, we don't know in what format yet, but um, you can ask other questions, if you ask questions about that if you like, and the people who can answer you are standing right over there. Um, but this is, um, this is a crisis which brings all the others together. Unfortunately, it has been erased uh, by the financial crisis, which is now, at least where I live, commanding all the news. And I am very sorry. I know South Africa was hoping for a breakthrough in this crisis and that the South Africans have worked very hard to make that happen. And I fear from everything I hear that this is simply not going to happen and that the cynicism that was already setting in in Cancun has gone even further and that we are um, that there is either a lack of interest on the part of governments or as Proffel said last night, everyone, all the states are trying to get someone else to pay for their misdeeds. Proffel, correct me, I haven't got the citation right probably, but it was that about, okay. Um, and this is, I think the the crisis of the century, and this is why the solutions are so important, and this is the longest chapter of the book. I, I know that usually you get a book like this and it's doom and gloom for 250 pages and then there's 10 or 15 that say, yes, but, you know. We, um, <laughs> well, I tried to get out of that trap. I mean, I had to set out what was wrong and I had to do quite a lot of doom and gloom, but uh, even so, uh, I made the longest chapter the one about the solutions because to me these are perfectly obvious and I have had the luck in my life, I have had a very, very fortunate life and I've been involved with two remarkable organizations. One is TNI and the other for the last 12 years is Attack in France where we've got a bunch of terrific economists and people who really understand money and that's how I've also had been able to learn about money and about, uh, what, and, uh, about many things going on in the world. And the, this, uh, this gift that other people have given to me, I felt it was really necessary to bring that out I in the solutions because to us, I mean to people who discuss these things all the time, it's so clear what needs to be done. And it's not that difficult. And it's not difficult to become involved in the solution either. First of all, you have to get control over any bank which has been used as a target for public money, for your money and mine. Those banks ought to be socialized. I prefer the word socialized to nationalized because what it means is that in the management of the bank, you would have the clientele, you'd have the customers, you would have the workers in the bank, uh, you would have, um, of course, if there are still shareholders, they would be there too, but not exclusively as is now the case, and you would have the government, but not just the government. That's a nationalization. I prefer the term socialization, but you have to get control over the money because 
So long as you don't have any control over that, you're dead. <coughs> the banks would then be instructed to, since I don't have any water, that's very nice. <laughs> And your wine is excellent, by the way. Um, you, you, since if you don't have control over the money, you're just whistling in the dark, basically. Once you have some control over the money, you want to add to it. You want a tax on financial transactions. You want a tax on carbon. You need to have international taxation. We in Europe need to get control over the European Central Bank. There are many suggestions of that kind, and I try to explain why these things are not technically difficult. And throughout the book, I think many people have told me that, that it's easy to read. You don't have to be an economist. I'm not an economist. And, and it, it's not technically difficult. I mean, it's quite straightforward. There are people who wanted more wealth and more power. They got it. Uh, they took us into the deep, dark hole, and, and now they want us to pay for it, which we are doing everywhere. We're all doing it. We're all paying. We're paying in our taxes. And now uh, in Europe uh, and in the United States, we're paying again uh, through our austerity programs, cutting down on public services, uh, reducing people's salaries, reducing people's retirement benefits, making school tuitions uh, higher than they ever were, uh, so there will be far fewer people getting a decent education, cutting down on health benefits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I like to quote a person whom I admire a lot, uh, who said, "All for ourselves, and nothing for other people, seems in every age of the world to have been the vile maxim of the masters of mankind." And when I ask people in the audience, who do you think said that? Well, let's play that game. <laughs> because there aren't too many people here who know the answer. Because uh, uh, who do you think maybe said that? Hmm? Speak up. Huh? I don't hear anything. Marx, no. That's usually the first answer is Marx. Huh? Groucho Marx, no, non plus, not I. Um, no, and it's not Machiavelli. Well, I'll stop playing the game. It's not that. It's not Machiavelli. It's not Thomas Hobbes. It is Adam Smith, who is the father of capitalist theory. He wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and he put that in it. The vile maxim of the masters of mankind, and the vile maxim of the masters at Davos is still exactly the same all for ourselves and nothing for other people. And that's the game they are playing. And if we allow them to continue, that is the game that they will, uh, they will continue to play because uh, there's nothing for, I mean, they have to take us back to the 19th century if they possibly can uh, because they haven't quite collected it all. So our solutions is about how to stop them doing it, basically. And once you have got control of the money, once you have got control over new sources of money, then what do you do? Well, you solve these crises, these four, I mean, there's probably more than the four that I describe, but you, you solve them by making what I call a Green New Deal. I am, am inspired by Franklin Roosevelt. I was a child during the Second World War. But I remember the period very well because everyone in the United States, where I was born, participated in the war effort. It, the country had never been so united before or since. And within the space of two years, Roosevelt had transformed the economy into an economy to win the Second World War and defeat fascism. How did he do it? He did it by creating jobs through a Keynesian program, meaning that you spend money, uh, you borrow if you have to. The United States became very indebted, but that's not a, a problem so long as a state has control over its own central bank. There were still social problems. There were still problems for minorities. There were still problems for women. But on the whole, everyone advanced, including women and including uh, African Americans. And this program 
was such that the economy took off, that inequalities became smaller, and it did not quite last long enough. Uh, and it was allowed after the 19, uh, after about 1980, that um, elan, that spurt of growth towards a much more equal society, a much fairer society, uh, was taken down by the neoliberals. But this remains for me an inspiration. But we don't have to have a war to do it again. What we need is to understand that the climate is changing and that there are ways still to prevent that, but it has to be done now, not tomorrow. And to do that, we have to invest um, a lot in uh, green technologies. Many people have said to me that I, but what I'm proposing is to prolong capitalism through uh, a, a Green New Deal. This is not exactly what I am proposing. But let me say that I do not know what the ideal state of future society is. I have never been in a political party that had a millennial view of the future, what we call in French les lendemains qui chantent, the, the, the tomorrow will be beautiful at the horizon. Uh, so I don't know the ideal state of future society. What I do know is that democracy can work, that if you can involve enough people, they will choose the best future together. They will make it happen. So I'm not going to say it has to be a state economy. I'm not going to say it has to be a Trotskyist future. And if you don't agree with me, and if you don't want, or a Maoist future, or a Stalinist future, and if you don't want that, then, then you get sent to a camp. That's not my. That's not my choice, right? My choice is for radical democracy, where every, as many people as can be involved are involved in the choice of that future. And that's why so many movements like the Occupy movement today, the Indignados, uh, these things are profoundly encouraging. The Arab Spring, uh, the end of apartheid here, of course, was something that made us all weep with joy. Um, and, um, and, and so, the history of emancipation of humanity is not over. This is still, it is still going on. And I think that's a applause, don't you? That the, <laughs> history of, the history of humanity is not finished. And the history of eman emancipation is not finished either. And it is to that that I invite uh, all of the readers of the book uh, in hopes that they will want to join in one way or another uh, the movement of which we are all a part, and I say we because I believe in that pronoun. I think if you have come here this evening, it's because you believe it too. So I want to thank you all very much for your presence here and your enthusiasm, and, and I hope you will want to ask questions and make comments. Thanks very much.